Hello YouTube, this is Morgan Airspeed Prime here with my next Korra comic review. This one is going to be a non-spoiler review for Legend of Korra Runes of the Empire Part 2. This book is actually going to be released on Tuesday, November 12th. My copy actually arrived two days early, so that's why I have it here and that's why I'm doing a non-spoiler review first. I don't want to spoil the book before it's out. I will be doing a spoiler review of this on Tuesday, so look out for that if you want to hear my thoughts on the details and so on. But uh, yeah, anyway, I'll, I'll give you guys a bit of a kind of preview um, ahead of Tuesday with uh, this um, review here. So overall, I'd say very, very solid comic. Um, it doesn't quite have the same impact as, you know, the, the start with Runes of the Empire Part 1 because it was just, yes, we're, we're covering the stuff that we want to cover. The middle part of the comics usually are never the best parts of the comic because they are just telling the middle part of the story. They neither have the sort of intrigue from the, the opening part that gets you started, nor the sort of finality and the big reveals of the part threes. So it, it kind of fits that mold in the sense of it, it plays the role that it has to tell of being that middle section of the story, it just means that we get a lot of, you know, different scenes, some of them good, um, some of them not as good, that, um, you know, work together nicely, but we don't get as, as much discussion-worthy content out of this as I was maybe expecting. And I think part of that is just that this one was so focused on what it had to do in terms of the plot that I don't feel the book ever really got its chance to really just stick with one of those plots and develop it in the way that they needed to. The The, the thing that people are most interested in in this book is Kuvira. There's a reason she's front and center on the cover and so on. That's what this series is about. And I, I just feel like while she sort of stands out in every scene that she's in, they're not quite getting in as deep as I think I nor many fans would want in that after the tease of part one with just those two pages of flashback I have to admit I was a little disappointed that we get to part two and once again there's only two more pages of flashback and it's still kind of a little vague you know what exactly are we trying to do with that flashback when you're telling it over such a small amount of pages like I, I sort of get where they're going with it but again it's putting so much pressure on part three to bring it full circle and you're kind of asking the question at this point is part three going to have enough time to resolve everything that it has to do is it going to have to have enough time to devote to Kuvira's backstory present day stuff with S Sue and Kuvira Cora and Kuvira and and all that sort of other stuff going on with her while also dealing with this kind of election plot line we've got going on the brainwashing stuff with Commander Guan uh, the King uh, King Wu stuff that they're doing, th th there's there's big stuff going on here, and in that sense, I sort of like, I would have maybe appreciated the book being a little bit more character driven. I would have appreciated just Kuvira getting to stand out a little bit more on her own, getting more of the flashback here, and not just leaving it all for part three. Um, the Search, uh, as one of the Avatar comics, I think is a good example of like a book that is sort of doing a similar thing to this. Of like, this is using Kuvira as like the centerpiece of the story. That book used Ursa as the centerpiece of the story, and the Search sort of surprised everyone when it was first when it first came out by going as in depth into Ursa's backstory as as they did. I think most people, when that book was first announced, just expected it to be, you know, Zuko, Zula, some of the, the team avatar, just looking for her, and then at the end of this, the, the series, we would eventually find her. So, like, opening up with the book, that with basically revealing that, like, we found her already, here is Ursa's backstory, so you know her character more, so you have context for when we actually do find her, which is earlier in the story than you think, it, it, it got so much development out of it and it's one of the best things in the comics was what they were able to do with Ursa as a character. And look, Kuvira is more developed within the show that she was in than Ursa was in ATLA. So you have a more developed character here, but also you have a lot of kind of unanswered plot points from the series with Kuvira. That's why this book is so interesting in that everyone was interested to know how they would tackle some of that stuff. And I still feel two two parts in two thirds of the way through they're still in a little bit too much of teasing that arc mode now thankfully 
you know, the, 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 you know the, the, as much as the backstory isn't really covered as much here, the two pages that we get are actually quite good. I won't spoil them for anyone, but they're, they are quite good. They answer like a little bit of questions that we had. Um, at least in the present day stuff, I think just Kuvira, you know, panel to panel as we get to see her, is showing some of that development. It, it's kind of showing you the direction of where she's going, that um, we don't have the full story just yet, but she is trying to be better. She is trying to help Korra and just be helpful. She isn't, it, it doesn't feel like she's plotting anything or like just trying to find a way to escape. It feels like she honestly does want to try and redeem herself, take down Guam because she disagrees with what he's doing and just fix some of what she's done that's wrong. And it, it feels like she at this point understands that the problems that she felt were other people in her life were actually at least partly down to her, that she has to take responsibility for her own actions, both in terms of what she did uh, across, you know, um, I suppose before book four and during book four, uh, as well as, I suppose, in her past as well. And we'll see how exactly they go about doing that in part three with the the clear setup across this book that she sort of opened the door to communication with Sue, but we don't quite get it here. We see them both just like walk past each other when they kind of meet again here, unwilling to talk. Even though they talk on the radio earlier on in the book when Kuvira calls her for help, when they actually come into contact, they just walk by each other. It's not quite the time yet to have the big uh, open discussion, but the fact that we do get some of Kuvira's thoughts on that through the little bit of a flashback that we get, and then there's a little bit of a moment with uh, Opal talking to Sue about uh, Kuvira, where again it seems like on Sue's side, Sue is also kind of wanting to, to open things up with uh, Kuvira as well, whereas Sue has been very harsh in terms of her criticism of Kuvira and it, f it feels like she is the, the one who is really unwilling to talk. It now feels like the door is open on both sides so part three I think just has to deliver a, a nice enough Sue and Kuvira scene. Plus they do some interesting setup with uh, you know some other stuff for Kuvira in terms of she because she is sort of captured along with the Sami Mako and Bolin at the start of this book she gets a look at the brainwashing kind of equipment but her she herself doesn't get brainwashed so she kind of holds the key in a way to fixing what, what has happened to Asami, Mako, and Bolin. Because of course everyone has seen that before. The part three cover clearly shows a brainwashed uh, Mako, Asami, and Bolin. That's the big sort of threat in this book is that it's not just go on with the election, but now look at what he's done. He has brainwashed Korra's best friends. And Kuvira was unable to help them at the time. And a big part of how she can sort of repay Korra is to help her reverse that brainwashing and so there's a character who they talk about a little bit in this book that it feels it seems like they're finally going to get back to here which is going to be very interesting for part three once again um, but um, yeah so, some nice setup with that in terms of you know I think going back into sort of the history and being like okay like they, they already told us that Guan and Dr. Shang were in the Earth Empire while Kuvira was um, Kind of running things but they they weren't in the most high positions now they are in the high positions they they cover more of that stuff which I, which I do like um and then like other stuff is like you know obviously we, we start the book with um you know Wu and Cora going to get Toph to ask her to run for governor that was the setup from part one we see that that happened they go through the swamp Wu actually has a vision very early on in the book of uh Queen Hu Ting and they do an interesting thing here with like giving Wu a character arc, which I do very much appreciate, that they don't just treat him as the comedy character. They're actually giving him some seriousness because he was the one who called for the elections. He's the one who is sort of making this change happen in the Earth Kingdom. And so this vision he has in the swamp is telling him in a way of what he's meant to do. And it's like, you know, it's basically questioning like, was Wu a coward? for turning down the position of being a king because it felt like at the end of book four he developed to the point where he could have made a good leader on his own so is was he sort of abandoning a role he could have taken to take sort of the easy path by you know 
thinking everyone in the Earth Kingdom wants, like, you know, democracy, so elections is the obvious way to go, whereas maybe it could have been just as easy for him to assume the throne and, you know, you know, help things that way. And it, it, it's just begging that question, and then they sort of use that vision to get Toph on side, which is one of the more confusing, I think, parts of the book in that from the preview pages when we didn't have everything, that was kind of like, wait, how is that going to lead to Toph joining them? And even after reading the book, I still feel like I sort of get what you were going for there, and that, like, Toph trusts the swamp, so a vision is something that, like, she would go for, but, like, I didn't quite get what Kor was going for, but, like, ah, this is the way where Toph will run, how, like, this woo-specific thing suddenly relates to, to Toph. It kind of works with some of the wording, but it's not the most clear-cut thing, so I think it could have been written a little bit better. Um, on a similar note, in terms of a more negative point, there's an action scene towards the end of the book that I, I feel was just very, very confusing. It just did not make it particularly clear the sort of you know geometry of the situation. Like, okay, in the middle of this battle, Kor is here. This character's here. This character's here, and then in like the space of like three or four panels, all of a sudden, wait, how do we have this character over here? How did how how is this character now holding on to this character over here? It was it was really clear. Like you just lost track of the fight scene completely with what was going on, and it just. It could have been better kind of plotted out in terms of, okay, so Kor does this over here, which is how this character then moves over here, and that's how they end up in this position. Um, like, it, again, it's one of those ones where it's more of a kind of, you know, technical point rather than like, okay, I get it. It's a fight scene. They end up taking this person. It doesn't really matter how they get them there, but it, it, it's just a confusing thing to try and follow the action in terms of, visually where they were versus where they are now and, and stuff like that um but like beyond that i think the art is still really really good i love michelle wong's art i hope we get to see her do more and more core comics as uh, we go on um i i think we we need to sort of get back into a, a situation where we have sort of a regular artist on the comics just so we have that consistency and aren't constantly changing uh, artists between books um just so we can get up and running again like we did when we had Team Girihiru doing like five comics in a row. Um, but um, yeah, is, is there anything else in terms of a kind of preview that I want to talk about? Um, okay, talked about the stuff in the swamp, the brainwashing a little bit, um, yeah, Kuvira throughout it, a little bit of backstory. Um, yeah, like I, I suppose like you know, it's more of a spoilery thing, but you know, Korra's and the crew's reaction I suppose to you know, a brainwashed Asami, Mako, and Bolin. Um, without going into too much depth, it's, it's one of those ones where, like, you know it's just based on how it's happened. It's not really them doing what they're doing here because they're being brainwashed. Um, but I still think it manages to get across a little bit of, uh, you know, that sense of, like, this is a crazy situation. That even though we know it'll be reversed by the end of the book, more than likely. I, I'd be shocked if it continued beyond this book. We know it's going to be reversed. Asami, Mako, and Bolin are going to be back to normal by the end of this. It is still an interesting situation to see Korra having to fight Mako, Bolin, and Asami. And especially with the relationship with Asami, seeing her have to face off against her like that, and just seeing Asami say these things to Korra. And as much as Korra knows it's not her, it still hurts that it, these words are coming out of Asami's mouth. Um, so I, I think that that actually managed to work quite well when it could have been a little bit of a thing where it's like, I don't really buy into this that much. We, we know they're just going to be fixed by the end of this. But it, it works. I, I, I do think it works. They they explain the brainwashing enough in this in this volume to, to get across like, okay, th there's a bit of a history behind this. It's not just that they pulled this out of nowhere. There is context for why where this research idea sort of came from and they do a good job of getting the history across I think as well so there's definitely some discussion to be had here I think it's you know overall like well written well constructed the brainwashing initially seems like a bit overboard but it makes sense since we've seen something similar before with the Dai Li and they, they referenced that here um, and yeah the, I'm just going to end it there because obviously like 
with these non-sporter reviews, there's not a ton to say without just going right into the details, and I feel I've already like maybe said a little too much here. But um, like I said, I, th I think it's it's a very good book. It is uh, absolutely it's a step above like the, uh, all all the parts of uh, Imbalance. It's a step above everything we saw in Turf Wars. A step above uh, Team Avatar Tales. It is the best comic we've had since Ruins of the Empire Part One. I would remain on the idea that I think Part One was kind of better, and that's mainly due to the fact that I think Part Twos tend to be on the the weaker side of things. Because you know, like I said, it's just you look through the book and like there's a bunch of scenes. You know, it covers all the different kind of plot points. I just feel there's never quite that opportunity in this book where we got to just linger on one scene and just get a piece of character development and just kind of have something kind of, uh, you know, meaty kind of happen that you can really discuss and kind of sink your teeth into. Um, that's sort of what I'm waiting for in terms of just the big moment, the, the, the scene of like two characters talking where you have to kind of analyze every word that they say to each other. It's the big talking point. We don't get that just yet. This is very much just flowing the plot from part one to set us up for part three. Uh, but it does it well. There are good moments along the way. There's a few little, I think, confusing moments that I think is what, for me, sort of brings this book slightly below Ruins of the Empire part one. But it's still very, very strong as a comic overall. And the art of, I think everyone loves Michelle Wong's art and it continues to be fantastic here. And then what it has compared to all of the other comics, I think is just having a focus on someone like Kuvira, a character we want to know where she's heading next. We want to know where her development is going. There's a lot of open ground to cover with Kuvira and focusing a book on her, I think just makes everything so much more interesting. It's something along this line is what we were missing in Imbalance and what it just didn't have to deliver. When its main plot didn't deliver and then nothing was going on with the characters and you didn't have a, a slightly newer character to really latch onto, um, this book sort of is delivering on more of those accounts. So um, that's probably the best way for me to describe this book is just that, you know, it, it plays its role, it does pretty much everything well, it just doesn't quite have the, you know, big, over-the-top, super, super memorable scenes that some of the other comics have had. Um, in that, you know, you you remember certain moments from other comics that really, really stand out. Like, a lot of the promise, which we, we, we went back to, I think it was last week on the podcast, so many memorable moments of just the moment where Zuko asks Aang for the promise. The moment at the end of the book when they come back to it and like Zuko and Aang both acknowledge their flaws with each other but it, but accept that you know it, they're, they're a part of them that always struggle with them but they can they can move on with that um, and it was just a, a real sense of character growth for the characters across that book that worked so well you know Katara saying to Aang you know I also imagined our future together as like a big sort of turning point about like uh, her view on the nations coming together and how it really she was helping Aang to form his opinion like scenes like that like Toph and Sokka talking about you know the the pressure and pain that she was put under and it's sort of how she forced herself almost to learn metal bending and now she's putting her students under all that pressure and pain is she a good teacher and it, it actually ends up inspiring the students to be better like kind of those type of moments like n not quite here but you can sense that it's setting up for a strong part three. I just hope part three is able to deliver on that. I hope it, I hope it delivers its page count effectively and devotes time to the backstory, devotes time to Kuvira and Sue, Kuvira and like everyone else that they need to deal with, cover the plot well, and you know, you know, we end coming out of Runes of the Empire with some clear cut. Kuvira has changed. You have to read this comic because of where Kuvira goes in this comic. That's what we're waiting for. Whereas, like, like you get a book like Imbalance, and it's like, start to finish, have any of the characters really grown? Not really. Have we progress progressed the plot all that much? Not really. Um, we don't want that to happen. As So far, across 1 and 2, it's, it's very, very promising, very strong. They just need to kind of, you know, 
had, you know, deliver on the last leg of this uh, three-part uh, book. So, yeah, there, there are my thoughts on, my non-spoiler thoughts on Runes of the Empire Part 2. In the comments, let me know what your thoughts are, if you happen to have got the book early. If you have any questions, I'll try to answer them without going into a lot of spoilers. Definitely leave some questions below. But like I said at the start, spoiler review where I'll go into full detail on everything will be on Tuesday when the book is officially uh, released. Um, we can just talk about it uh, as much as we want. Uh, podcast will likely be also planned for next week as well. Myself and Greg will do a full you know, read through of the book. You know, we'll discuss every page basically. And that should be very, very interesting. But yeah, that's been the video. Thanks for watching and bye.